Okay, well, let's turn our attention to our study here this morning. We're going to shift gears. We're going to take a little break from our walk through the Gospel of John. And we're going to focus for five weeks on Christmas, on Jesus coming into the world. And really, I'll tell you, I should have told you this last week, but these will be wonderful Sundays if you have a friend you would like to invite to church maybe for the first time. This would be a wonderful sort of bridge opportunity uh, for them to connect with the heart of the Christian message, which is Jesus and who he is. So, what, nine days ago? Nine days? Nine days ago? Eight days ago? Was Black Friday. In my mind, this is the beginning of the Christmas season. So, for example, I tried very hard not to play any Christmas music before Black Friday. We did put up some Christmas lights on our house when the weather was nice, but I resolutely refused to let them be turned on until Black Friday. So Black Friday, it began. And as is our tradition, our kids piled into our van and we went out to the woods to cut down a Christmas tree. For $7, you can get a permit to go cut down a tree in the Chippewa National Forest. And so we go to our usual place, our secret fishing hole for Christmas trees. We cut down a tree. We tied it on the roof of our van and drove down the highway. We tied it much better to the roof of the van than we did last year when it went flying off onto the highway like a torpedo fired from a U-boat. Learned our lesson. We did better this year. We got the tree up at home, and for a new record for us, before we even got lights on the tree, some of my kids sprang into action. They went and wrapped stuff, and look at this picture. We had presents under the tree before there were even lights on the tree. That was a new record for us. So um, we have seven kids. And once these kids are old enough to start buying each other presents, if almost everyone in the family is buying presents for almost everyone else, the number of presents we end up with under our tree is truly shocking. Unwrapping these presents takes an entire day, especially when there's countless boxes of mac and cheese wrapped up, um, (laughs) each one deserving its own careful unwrapping. Now, a common fixture of Christmas presents is the name tag. And a name tag is important on a present because the name tag tells you who it's from and who it's for, right? And without that name tag, there could be trouble. The two-year-old could get the hunting knife. The teenager could get the trash truck underwear. You know, all sorts of mix-up name tags. Well, here at Christmas, for the next five weeks, we're going to zero in on the names, five key names and titles that we see in the Gospel of Luke applied to Jesus in the story of his birth. And as we look at the ways that Jesus is named and described in the Gospel of Luke, this is going to function as kind of name tags on a present. Jesus is God's gift to us. And by looking at these name tags together, we can find clarity in terms of where Jesus came from and who he is for. And it's important for us because this is Christmas, the time of the year where we purposefully reflect on, as Matt said, the darkness of our world and the light of Christ's coming. And so we want to leverage this opportunity to warm our hearts with faith and love for the Lord and draw near to him in this season that he might strengthen us to endure all the darkness and all the hardship and suffering that we are also faced with in this world. So today we're going to zero in on the most basic, the most essential, and perhaps the most important name for the Son of God, the very simple name, Jesus. So let's look again at where this name first shows up in Luke's story of his birth. We just heard it, but look here on the screen. This is where Gabriel says to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Jesus. Let's unpack this name. It's a weird one. Maybe you're like, wait, I never slowed down and thought about this before. I mean, Jesus is Jesus. But there's actually a lot to think about here. What does this name mean? Where does it come from? Well, our Bibles, the first half was written in the ancient language of Hebrew, the language of the people of Israel. The New Testament, the newest half written after Jesus, is written in the ancient language of Greek, which was the commonest language in the first century where Jesus came into and his disciples began spreading his message. So in Greek... As we see in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke was originally written in this language of Greek. 
The name Jesus there is this one in Greek, Iesus. So this is a Hebrew name that has been brought into Greek as it is written down in our Bibles. So in older Hebrew, in the language spoken by Israel, in the oldest parts of the Old Testament, this name is Yehoshua, or as we might say in English, Joshua. So did you know that Jesus' name is actually the name Joshua? Anybody named Josh in here? Joshua? Couple? Yeah. Well, in, in later Hebrew, not quite as old, this name gets shortened from Yehoshua to Yeshua. Yeshua. So this would have been how Jesus' name was pronounced in Hebrew and Aramaic, the local language that Jesus primarily would have spoken in the first century. So when the, when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, he says his name will be Yeshua, which is simply the Hebrew name that we know as Joshua. Well, when the stories of Jesus get written down in the Gospel of Luke, as I said, this comes into Greek. This name Yeshua gets transliterated, moved into the Greek language, and becomes Jesus. Time goes by, the Greek New Testament moves into the common language of Latin, is translated into Latin language as very similarly, Jesus. And then later, when this first gets put into English, the name was actually pronounced the same, Something I didn't know before this. Did you know that at one time the letters I and J were actually the same letter? This is why they're next to each other in our alphabet. Because they were actually the same letter. It was the letter I. And scribes sometimes would start writing a normal I, and sometimes they would put a little curly Q on the bottom. So in the earliest days of English, Jesus' name was still spelled with an I and was pronounced Iesus. Well, look at this picture, for example, of a very old English Bible. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, I guess you can see it. Look at there. Chapter 2, we ought to be obedient to Christ. And look, how are they spelling Jesus? I-E. So this is the English name for Jesus in the old days, Iesus. Well, then along came this man in the early 1500s, John Giorgio Trissino, an Italian grammarian. This guy is known as the father of the letter J. He's the first one that distinguished. He said, wait a minute, we should pronounce the I like this, but this other curly Q version, we should pronounce J. So he's the inventor of the letter J. And so eventually English shifted and began to pronounce the curly Q version J instead of E or I. And so this is how in English we began saying J, Jesus, instead of Jesus. So there's where the name Jesus, Jesus grows from, okay? From Hebrew to Greek to Latin to Old English to our current English. So in our culture today, Jesus' name is Jesus. Okay, well, that's all fine and interesting. Let's go back and reflect on one aspect of this name. The name Jesus, or Yeshua, is what name in Hebrew? What's our version of it? Joshua. That means if you are a Christian, you are a follower of the Lord of all history, the Son of God, the great King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the world, and his name is Josh. Did you know you're a follower of your Lord and Savior, Josh? Does that sound impressive? No, it doesn't. That doesn't sound impressive at all. And in fact, that name, Joshua, was very common in the first century in the Jewish world. Kind of like our name, Josh. Not unusual at all. There were plenty of guys running around in the first century with the same name as Jesus. So accordingly, we see multiple people named Jesus in the New Testament, believe it or not. Look at one example. Here's Colossians. The end of Colossians, Paul writes this. Jesus, who is called Justice also sends greetings. So Paul had a friend named Jesus, who was a follower of Jesus, the Lord. So what do we learn from this? I think here we can be reminded of Jesus' human nature. 
I mean, it's true as we've been talking about this fall in the Gospel of John that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. There was never a time when he was not. He existed in all eternity in perfect relationship within the Holy Trinity with God the Father. But at the same time, when Jesus comes to earth, when he's born at that, as that little baby, he takes on a full human nature. Just as Jesus shared fully in God's divinity, so too Jesus shares fully in our human nature except only without sin. So when Jesus came to earth, he had to do all the normal, ordinary things. Jesus was a kid. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to read. He had to learn to tie his sandals. He had to do chores around the house. He had to trip and fall and skin his knee. He must have had favorite foods. When he got older, he had to get a job and work and to support himself. He had to make his bed. He had to go to the market to buy and sell food. And his name was Josh. The prophet Isaiah put it this way long before Jesus' birth, prophesying this one who would come. Look at Isaiah 53. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So as a human being, was Jesus very impressive? No. Jesus shared in our ordinariness. Notice how little there was to attract attention to Jesus in his early days. This is a passage out of Mark 6. Look on the screen. This is when he comes and preaches back in his own hometown. The people that hear him, that knew him growing up, say this. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Somehow growing up in Nazareth, everyone knew everybody, and there was nothing particularly remarkable that they had observed about Jesus. And they were offended when all of a sudden he showed up talking all this highfalutin nonsense, they thought. So we see Jesus in the incarnation coming into our ordinariness. And this is part of the miracle of Christmas, that God himself in God's humility comes as one of us. This gift comes with the humble name tag, Josh. Well, there's something else to learn about this name. Because in Hebrew, this name, Joshua, is what is called a sentence name, meaning it actually says something. It makes a sentence. It's got two parts. So the first part of this is Joe, like Jesus, or yeah. This part is an abbreviation of God's name. Now, God has a lot of names in the Old Testament in Hebrew, but the most special and most sacred of these names that he reveals, for example, to Moses in the burning bush incident is the name Yahweh. And so in Jesus' name, that J in English, or the Y that we see in Hebrew, Yeshua, this is actually God's sacred name, Yahweh, that is part of Jesus' name. So reverent was the ancient Jewish people for the name of Yahweh, they would actually not pronounce it out loud because they didn't want to dishonor God. So when they would be reading the Old Testament scriptures and they would come along to the name Yahweh, instead of pronouncing it, instead they would read in their word for Lord. Now this same tradition is actually continued by our English translations. So if you're reading in the Old Testament, sometimes you will see the word Lord written of God, and it's all in capital letters. So when you see that written all in capital letters, that's your English translation telling you that in that text there, that is actually God's sacred personal name, Yahweh. So many of our Bible names in English that start with J, these names include God's sacred name, Yahweh. So Jeremiah, Josiah, John, Jacob, James, Jean, Jane, Jude, Judah, Joel. All of those names, the J would have been a Y. And this is in Hebrew coming from God's name, Yahweh. So Jesus has one of these names, Joshua. 
So the first part, Je, Jesus, Je, is God's sacred name and the subject of the sentence. The second part, Shua, right, because it's Yah, Shua is his name in Hebrew. The Yah stands for Yahweh. The second part of that, the Shua, comes from a Hebrew word which means to save, to deliver, or to help. For example, this word is used in a verse like this one on the screen, Psalm 20, verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves. Notice Lord's in all caps. Our translation is telling us that's the name Yahweh. And that next verb, saves, is this same word, Shua, Yesha. So this verse is saying Yahweh saves. So this is what Jesus' name means in Hebrew. Joshua, Yeshua, means Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation. So notice the great significance of that name. Remember, Jesus is not given this name by accident. Look again at Luke's gospel, what the angel says. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Joshua, Yeshua, a.k.a. Yahweh saves. So we are told this is a divinely commanded name that this baby is to bear. We're not told the significance or why here in Luke's gospel, but let's pop over to Matthew's version of the birth of Jesus and look what the angel tells Joseph when he's instructed to give the boy this same name. This is Matthew 1. The angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And notice we have an explanation. Because he will save his people from their sins. Notice the angel doesn't explain to Joseph why. Even Matthew, the author of the Gospel of Matthew, doesn't write and tell us why. Why is the kid going to be named Jesus? Because... God will save him from, God will save his people from his sins. It's not explained to us. But Matthew would have understood, and, and Joseph would have understood. Anyone that knew Hebrew would understand, oh, right, because the name Jesus means Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. And so the angel tells Joseph, this is the name you are to give him, because he will save his people from their sins. And that's the biggest threat in life, by the way. Crossing the street is dangerous. Motorcycles are dangerous. Guns are dangerous. Cancer is dangerous. War is dangerous. Drugs are dangerous. But nothing is more dangerous than sin. Why? Because sin is the presence of evil within us. It's the incurvature of the soul toward itself. It is the brokenness, the destruction of wholeness and peace. Sin is our selfishness, our idolatry, our hatred, our violence, our using other people, our continual lust for more and more. Nothing is more dangerous than this because sin rips us from our creator. If there's anything true about there being a God, what becomes most important in all of existence is understanding him and being rightly related to him. And what Jesus would have said, what the scriptures say is that this presence within us that is inescapable in us, this sin rips us from God. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah wrote. In chapter 59, to the people of that day, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble to give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. And when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds. The 
The acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks among them will know peace. Sin is the greatest threat for us in all of existence. Because this has the capability and the power to separate us from God forever. Because when we are bound up and lost in sin, we are on the path to destruction. Now and for eternity. Jesus came to save us from this. The angel tells Joseph. If we will believe in Jesus if we will trust in him, if we will pledge our allegiance in him, if we will accept his offer of forgiveness, we are saved and delivered from the evil power and the judgment of sin. So remember this verse. This is the last one we looked at last week, if you were here, just the end of John chapter 3. John writes this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. God's wrath his judgment, his displeasure, his anger, his condemnation, his damnation. This rests on us as we, as Paul writes, by nature are objects of wrath. So the Bible assessment of humanity is that there, we are both noble and beautiful and good as humans, but we are also profoundly marred, broken, and fallen. And we are incapable of lifting ourselves out of the state we find ourselves in, bound up in sin. But God's grace and kindness is to us that Jesus comes into this darkness, God's gift to us to save us from our sins. This is what his name means. You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So are you his people? If you have believed in Jesus, if you have pledged your allegiance to him, if you have submitted your knee to him as king of the universe, you are his people. When we believe in Jesus, we are united with Jesus via the Holy Spirit. What Jesus goes on to do is, you know, he dies on the cross. He pays the price for all of the guilt and judgment of this sin that we deserve. He fully absorbs God's wrath on our behalf. And then he dies. But we needed not only our sins forgiven, we needed death defeated. And so God on the third day raises Jesus back to life in the defeat of death and the resurrection. And in Jesus, we are offered the forgiveness that comes by Jesus' purchase on the cross and the defeat of death and the eternal life that comes through his resurrection. And if we believe in him, we are united with Jesus so that his death is our death, our sins are forgiven, and his resurrection is our new life. Now in this life and one day at his return, we will be physically raised back to life and live with him forever in the restored heavens and the restored earth where evil, suffering, and death and sin is finally done away with. That's very good news. So he calls to you. God offers you this gift of forgiveness. And if you have not accepted that gift, I urge you to do it today. Bow your knee before him. Say, Jesus, I believe you did these things. I pledge my allegiance to you. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. I am yours. And maybe you're on a journey of exploration and you're exploring faith in God and you're not ready to take that step just yet. Well, I'm very glad you're here with us considering these things. I think what God would have us do is all of us just keep taking one more step towards him. What is the next thing he is calling you to do? Well, today we just unpack Jesus' name. The first title he's given in the Gospel of Luke, the name Jesus. We see two significances to this name. Uh, First of all, how insignificant the name is. It's nothing special. So God the Son takes on flesh. He comes into our ordinary humanity. He burped, he pooped, he peed, he got sick, he got tired, he took naps. And his name was Josh. Here we see God's humility. Here we see God's condescension in a positive sense to lower himself to come and meet us where we're at. 
But the second significance in this name, Jesus, Yeshua, is God's act of salvation. That Jesus comes as the culmination of God's workings with all of his people. The coming of God's kingdom. Jesus shows up in the scene and begins preaching, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. God's rule, God's restoration, his intervention in the world to save and defeat evil, this comes in Jesus. Jesus came to save us from our sins. He dies on the cross, is raised back to life, ascends to heaven. He rules at the right hand of God and one day will return to put all things into submission. God the Father, the final defeat of sin, death, and the devil. So Christmas name tags. You need name tags on your presents. Without the name tag, you won't know who it's from or who it's for. Someone very kindly in this church gave me a gift this week. They left it in my little church mailbox. It was a beautiful, illustrated deck of Lord of the Rings playing cards. Beautiful. Just one problem. Didn't have a name tag. I don't know who it was. So thank you. But an interesting example of the gift without the name tag. I don't know who it's from. Now, it did say Greg, so I knew who it was for, and it was in my mailbox. Well, this gift that God gives us in the person of his son come to earth, he comes with multiple name tags. And these name tags show us who he is from and who he is for. And we see this no more perfectly in the name of Jesus. Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. This most essential name for Jesus, this name tag tells us that Jesus comes from God and he is given for us. For we are the ones that need to be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you for your humility that we see in this, O oh God, that you would leave heaven, Jesus, and be born as one of us to submit to our ordinariness, to submit to our pain and our suffering, and then to submit even to death on a cross. Thank you, Father, that you raised your son from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, that you live uncorruptible forever. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live and move among us to connect us to God.